Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to Fallen London. Today we're going to be carrying on with the exceptional story, The Laws of the Game. You bump into the somber goalkeeper on your way back to the pitches. They are pacing back and forth, their eyes haunted. With the aid of the ancient striker, you manage to sit him down and calm him enough to get an explanation. The regulator asked me to watch the match between Lavender House and the No Names Club, he says, thrusting notebook towards you. It's blank. I remember the dancing and the chanting, the strange sparks too, and then it was like my eyes twisted into my brain. And then I'm here. The ancient striker laughs. That sounds about right for the No Names Club game. I played them once for Somerset College. Half the team had to skip the next day's classes. One of my teammates, a linguist, never quite recovered. The ancient striker leads the somber goalkeeper towards your team's dressing shed. Why don't you rest for a bit while our friend here sorts out our next opponent? They're talking about the No Names Club, which has got me interested in them. Wearing red satin with their faces covered by masks. Eldritch occurrences are common whenever they take to the pitch. Let's go, let's play against the mysterious No Names Club. Chancel House Officials 0, No Names Club 0. True to their earlier form, the No Names Club announced their arrival on the pitch with a burst of pageantry and smoke. As a small pop as a red flare ignites in the centre of the pitch, clearing to reveal the dancing forms of the opposing players. As each settles into their position, they bow theatrically towards their opposite number. A rather tall player, with a stork mask, wearing a kit that has one trouser leg and a skirt, bows to you. Despite the opening theatricality, once the referee blows her whistle, the opening minutes pass in a fairly routine manner. Both teams get their chance to pass the ball around and make a few polite tackles, as you get each other's measure. The ball eventually finds its way over to you, unmarked on the wing with the stalk nowhere to be seen. You take the chance to dribble, managing to keep it moving forward despite the uneven pitch. Cross! comes the shout from the ancient striker as you approach the box. In that instant, as you pass the white pebbles marking the edge of the opponent's box, you notice something carved into the sludge beneath your left foot. It ignites, a spark of blue-green flashing upwards past your head. As you recover from your dodge, you realise that your right foot has landed on yet another of these sigils. So we have two options, we can focus on dodging the sparks, avoid the fire and keep the ball if you can, or we can cross the ball into the box. Maybe being hit will be worth it if your team gets a goal out of it. Uh, let's focus on dodging, shall we? You lift your right foot back, and the fire that shoots up only singes a few hairs. Realising that the sigils seem mostly ahead of you, you move backwards. As you do, you flick out a foot to catch the ball and pull it with you. Glance around at the floor, checking underfoot. When you look up, you see one of the defenders, this one wearing a snake-like mask, rush towards you. The regulator calls out before the defender can make the tackle, you pass the ball safely their way. Your attack has been stopped dead in its tracks, still You'd rather take an earful from the ancient striker than burst into eldritch flame. Oh no, we didn't... <laughs> we didn't make any goals. It's still nil-nil. In the aftermath, you spot your stork-mast counterpart. Instead of tracking you, they are near the centre of the pitch, doing some kind of dance. Arms twirling in wide circles, feet dragging in angular arcs. Seeing you spot them, they wink. The enthusiastic bruiser is livid. 
complaining to the referee on your behalf. The ardent regulator rushes over. The dance is part of this game, you hear them saying as they drag the bruiser away. We're going to have to adapt. As if to underscore their point, your opponents kick off quickly. Their two strikers, one wearing a weasel mask and the other a ferret, break to the wings and begin a mirrored dance. The stork-masked midfielder receives the ball and dribbles towards your goal with uncanny speed, each of their steps taking them twice as far as one of your own. So we can either try to nick the ball back, who cares if the other team is doing some fancy dance, a good tackle is a good tackle, or we can attempt to disrupt the dance. The dance is mirrored, maybe if you can take one of their places. Let's try to uh, disrupt the dance. You step in front of one of the dancing opponents, using your body to keep them out of the way. You feel the pull to the mirror. You feel the pull to the mirror, the other dancer's patterns. You feel the pull to mirror the other dancer's patterns, but manage to make small tweaks to your form. An ankle twisted an extra 10 degrees, a pinky raised just so. A jump executed a beat too late. Suddenly, the dribbling midfielder screams, their momentum halts as their legs are slowed to half their previous speed. They crash into the mud, failing to keep their balance. Ever composed, the cautious sweeper darts in to claim the ball. We are losing, oh no. Chancel House Official Zero? Two to the No Names Club. During the second half, you notice that the scoreboard doesn't quite match up with the goals scored. For some reason, the No Names Club seem to have been awarded two extra goals. Maybe this is another one of their incantations, whispers the enthusiastic bruiser. I can deal with them trying to singe my eyebrows off, but if they've been meddling with my memory, they'll be he- They'll pay. The referee shrugs as you ask about it. Style goals. My assistant assigns them whenever a team does something elegant with the ball or the dancing alphabet. Looking at the score, the assistant referee doesn't think much about how you've played. The fresh-faced scamp with his popped collar and fashionable sports boots looks aggrieved. What does the assistant know about style? I'm the most stylish player on this pitch and I've not even got a mask on. With the game approaching its end, whether through style or good old-fashioned football, you find yourselves needing to push for goals. Three options. We can try a dance of our own. Keep the ball and focus on showing off your skills. We can focus on scoring a goal, stick to what you know, getting the ball into the back of the net, or we can try a spectacular dance of your own. Perform the dance and score the goal. Guaranteed victory. What a fantastic idea. Let's do both. Standing in a circle, you send the ball back and forth between you, each pass drawing a line in your dance. The defender does a twirling dribble. The regulator pirouettes as he passes, pile to catch the ball between your legs. As you snap back up, you squeeze your thighs together, pinging the ball forward with a fresh-faced scamp. The pattern that you drew with your passes darkens to ember red momentarily, rising to orbit the ball. The scamp controls the ball in the air with one foot, then volleys it with the other. The dark cloud crackles like thunder as the ball flies as fast as a bullet into the net before bursting out through the back of it. The assistant lets out a little gasp. Three goals for that, he shouts. Chancel House officials three, the No Names Club two. The referee blows the whistle for full time and both teams come to a halt. The No Names Club players bow towards their counterparts. You swear you see your stork-masked rival blow a kiss before they are swallowed by another pop of scarlet smoke. When the smoke clears, they are somehow already at their team's bench, holding porcelain plates 
and eating finger sandwiches. The ardent regulator stands near the center of the pitch, notebook already in hand. Quick, quick, gather round. I want to get everything down, just in case they do memory tricks. Claim our victory. The enthusiastic bruiser slaps a broad palm across the regulator's back. There'll be time for taking notes later, he says. We won! If you're worried about forgetting things, let's not forget to celebrate. The regulator grins, as if considering your victory for the first time. We did, didn't we? All right, everyone, in a circle, arms together. You huddle around, linking arms. On three, you all take a step backwards before rushing towards each other, cheering. As the circle breaks and one by one you make your way back to the changing sheds, the regulator finds a compliment for each of you. And you too, they say as you begin to drift away. I saw your battle with a fellow in the stork mask today. You did well to win that particular duel. Two down, says the ardent regulator as you enter their office. Only one more to go. They correct themselves. Well, two, actually. We have the showcase match to put together, once the tournament is finished and the rules are finalized. Thankfully, we don't have to play that today. We search around for a pen. My benefactor has requested it. Once the rules are set, we'll take part in a match that will show all of London the benefits of football. It will be our chance to get everyone excited about the choices we've made today. Speaking of those choices, what did you make of the last match? Let's compare notes with the ardent regulator. The regulator wants your input on their version of football. After a midday break for food, you go to find the regulator in their office. You find them holding a note, a frown across their face. The regulator turns, noticing your presence. Come in, let's get to it. You place the note on the desk. It's promptly buried under the regulator's draft manuscript the laws of the game. What a cracking game, the regulator beams at you. I'd heard all about the No Names Club's rules, but it was revelatory to see them in person. Hells, I hadn't seen true grace on a football pitch until today. He pauses. I worry, though. Beauty has its place in the game, but you also need fire, fury, some brutality, too. What do you think? There are a couple of elements that we should consider including. He ticks them off with his fingers. The dance, obviously, though perhaps the arcane language would ex exclude too many. There's the scoring, too. It's good to have a tiebreaker, and we could always tweak it to reward something other than style. Perhaps it's a bit esoteric, though. The regulator falls into a mumble as they scribble their thoughts into their notebook. Eventually, their pen slows to stop, awaiting your ideas. So we can incorporate rules for dance and the correspondence, beauty and grace combine for strange effect, or we can incorporate intricate rules for bonus goals. More ways to score goals means a more exciting game. I'm going to go with dance. The regulator takes a bite from a piece of toast, long gone cold. I admit, they say after a few moments of chewing, that there are aspects of the dance that frighten me. What would it mean for the game? But that's precisely why you might be right. Imagine the stratagems and ploys teams could use if the game incorporated the dance. I will, of course, need to do some more consultations and hold some more discussions with the No Names Club to establish limits and rules. They say, through a second mouthful of toast. Your perspective has been invaluable. If it were me alone, I would never have dared include something so potentially revolutionary. Those are some excellent suggestions, the regulator says, writing furiously. I feel like we're getting somewhere with the game. Their eyes flick to the letter, half buried beneath the notebook, though I may have to fend off my benefactor's suggestions. Well, let's ask about said strange note. What was the regulator reading before you came in? The regulator pulls the envelope out from underneath the notebook. It's printed on bright white paper, sealed with wax, but no, insignia. This, there's a regulator, 
It's from my benefactor. They must have some sway in the ministry. Apparently, they secured this position for me. They've mostly been content to let me get on with things on my own, but as the rules go grow closer to completion, they seem more ardent about what they want from the sport. All rigor and hard work above skill and joy. The enthusiasm they held while discussing the game has given way to a glum demeanor. They hand the note over to you. Take a look. Do we ask about the benefactor? Does the regulator know anything about their identity? The regulator sighs. I wish I knew. When I first had the idea to codify an ironclad set of rules for football, I reached out to all kinds of people who might have the connections or finances to help me. Every one of them rejected my ideas. They drum the nib of their pen on their notepad a few times. Then, one day I was seconded from my public interests position, returned from lunch to find that all the things from my office had been moved into this room, halfway across the city. I thought about trying to figure it out, but I'm getting to do the work I wanted. Sometimes it's best not to pry too far into ministry business. Interesting. Can we investigate the identity? We can. Perhaps there's a clue contained within the letter. You spend some time looking over the letter, trying to establish what you can about the benefactor's identity. You easily pick up some minor details. The slant on the writing leads you to believe they are left-handed. An indent on the page shows you that their name likely starts with R, and there's a smudge of dirt that reminds you of the soil from the south of the Thames. The basics out of the way, you land on two more pertinent details. The first is that the writer's observations, combined with the freshness of the ink, lead you to believe that they have been present at today's matches. The second is an impression of a crest, so faint that you need to hold the page to the light to see it. You recognize it as belonging to the Anglican Church. The regulator tenses as you tell them this. I have my suspicions about who it could be. If I'm right, perhaps we can catch them at the next game. Let's find out what the benefactor wants. Rummage through the benefactor's backlog of requests. You read through the benefactor's litany of requests. They include, but aren't limited to, excessively large pitches, footballs made from heavier leather, and a bizarre suggestion that a team that concedes a goal does two laps of the field. There's been more where that came from over the last few months, says the regulator, pulling out a handful of letters from a bin beside the desk. The suggestions in these letters, from mandatory team anthems to playing in winter so that the lacquer on the pitch resembles mud and the players are exposed to the elements, follow the same pattern. The benefactor desires the game to be as strenuous as possible, to in their words, create a game that fortifies the body and spirit of the young folk who play it. Let's query those suggestions. To put it nicely, not all of them are winners. Do you need to include them? Some of them, yes, says the regulator. All of them? God, I hope not. The regulator flips to the back page of their notebook. There, written in minuscule letters, is a list of all their benefactor's suggestions. I've been trying to keep a track of the more sensible, least disruptive suggestions. Extending the game to three hours to ensure the fittest team wins, a military-style march-up for throw-ins, pre-game handshake ceremonies. This whole business puts me off, though, they say. What if I can't hold off their interference? Every time a letter appears on my desk, I begin doubting the entire business. What if the anarchy of all these different rules is the point? What if this casts me as destroyer of the game, not its shepherd? They remember your presence, mid-woe, and hold their hand up in apology. There's no space for all that right now. We have another game to play. Let's to it. Let's wrap up the conversation. The tournament has broken for lunch. 
The charnel house and no-names players sit separated into their own teams. That all changes when the Vendor Blight and Lavender House arrive. You can barely tell the two sets of players apart. The colours of their kits are disguised by mud, their bodies covered in cuts and bruises. Despite the apparent violence of their game, they arrive leaning on each other's shoulders, singing football chants. Their mood is infectious. Soon all of the players are mixing, sharing not only stories but food. A fine feast is assembled, a platter of jelly deals provided by the No Names Club, spiced and honey roasted cheeses from the Lavender House, pickles and dried seafood from Vendor Blight. The Charnel House contribution is a cornucopia of sandwiches made by the fresh-faced scamp's mum, enough to feed every player twice over. Bellies full, a lull settles over the gathered teams. A few players' eyes begin to close. Before yours can do the same, you're startled by the enthusiastic bruiser slapping her thighs beside you. Right, time to run this off. Who are we playing next? We're playing against the fanatical Lavender House Wanderers. Dressed in sackcloth and accompanied by the tinkling of a thousand tiny bells, Dead football is said to be violent and frenetic. What could possibly go wrong? The changing rooms at Charnel House are a hastily converted row of slanted sheds filled with forgotten archives. They're barely big enough for a single player to get dressed in, even with the mouldering paperwork pushed to one side. Someone has left an untidy heap of rags on the floor of your team's shed, making squeezing in alongside the enthusiastic defender a tricky prospect. They're not mine, mate, he says. Those are for you to wear. Captain's orders. Speaking of the devil, the ardent regulator announces their arrival at the door with a nervous rap. Have you had any chance to take a look? I imagine you'll have questions. What? Let's inspect the heap. This doesn't look like your usual football kit. You lift up a piece of the heap fabric. It jingles. As you raise it further, it turns out that the whole pile is connected. It forms one elaborate sackcloth costume tied with yellow and black ribbons so that it resembles a bee, if you squint hard enough. Whoever sewed this monstrosity decided that every surface should have a tiny bell attached to it. Can't imagine why you'd want to play a game of football in this. Let's ask why we have to wear it. Not very flattering. Can't someone else wear it instead? This is the mascot. By the Lavender House rules, each team has to have one. The Wanderer's captain was kind enough to donate us a spare, says the regulator. Seeing the look in your eyes, they continue. We don't get to choose who plays as the mascot. I believe there's a rather elaborate ritual involving smoking a hive of bees with special incense. Where the bees land, so goes the mascot. It seems you were chosen. It'll be fun, I'm sure. Uh, time to put on the bee suit. Doesn't seem like you have another choice. The suit seems to have been turned inside out. Ribbons and straps tangled. It takes help from both the regulator and the bruiser to get it on right. Once attired, you have to squeeze your way out of the changing shed, unleashing a cacophony of jingles. Looking good, the fresh-faced scamp says with a smirk. As you begin your walk to the pitch, the ardent regulator arrives beside you. There's one last rule I should mention. The game ends when you or the other team's mascot collapses. The other team will be trying anything they can to make that happen, and the referee won't stop them. Try to keep going as long as you can. If you're the one that collapses, they'll get a bonus goal. The game will end when one team's B can no longer stand, balance scoring goals with attacking the opponent's mascot. You are, alas, wearing a B suit. It's a slow waddle from the changing rooms to the pitch. Every step comes with a jangle of bells. It's a wonder that you manage to wade through the mud without falling over. Playing football in this thing will be another matter entirely. As you wait for the referee and captains to work out who kicks off, what end each team is attacking, 
you spy the other teams be. It's a slight consolation you're not the only one dressed like this. The Lavender House Wanderers win the toss and both teams line up, the opposing bee directly opposite you. The only thing you can see of the person beneath the costume is their eyes. They stare daggers at you while you wait for the whistle to blow. When it finally does, you're immediately under fire. A Wanderer's player boots the ball right at you, with as much sting as they can muster. Well, let's begin the game by trying to dodge the ball flying towards my face. You manage to duck just before the ball hits you. You feel it whiz over your head, taking a jangling antenna with it. It seems the regulator was right. The other team is out to get you. As the ball rolls to you, you spot the ardent regulator slip their marker. You quickly lay off a pass to them, with the ball now in their possession. The regulator pauses for a second, drawing the defender closer before they can be tackled. They flick the ball upfield to the ancient striker. She controls the ball while using her strength to hold off a defender at the edge of the opponent's box. She screams for support, prompting you and the fresh-faced scamp to charge past her towards the opposing goal. Though we can either focus on scoring, rush into the box, who cares if you get hurt doing it, or we can distract the defenders, get the defenders to focus on you, giving the scamp a chance to score. Let's do that. Realising the defenders have half an eye on you as well as the ball, you decide to make the most of it. You unleash a torrent of mocking challenges and ribald insults, trying to rile them up. It works. It works almost too well. Two of the opposing players completely abandon their posts to chase after you. Despite the weight of your suit, you manage to outpace them, leaping to dodge their shoulders, elbows and feet. By the time they realise what you're doing, the fresh-faced scamp has the ball in the opponent's goal, ricocheting off the enemy bee. As you celebrate, the opponent's goalkeeper gives their defenders an earful. So we scored a goal and the enemy's bee took a few hits? Okay, we're back here again. Uh, should we focus on scoring or should we distract the defenders again? It's the same thing again, let's just distract the defenders again. It worked last time. Yep, we're winning. I kind of want to focus on scoring just to see what happens. Let's try it. Rush into the box. Who cares if you get hurt doing it? You crash into the box, barging through the defenders to arrive in front of the goal. You look down, expecting the ancient striker's pass, but the ball is nowhere to be seen. You've been used as a distraction. The striker plays the ball to the scamp, who skillfully dribbles his way to the goal line. As the opposing goalkeeper rushes towards him, the scamp lifts the ball over his head to you. You tap it into an empty net. As you wheel off to celebrate, the scamp leaps onto your back. Lovely stuff, let's try to get another. Channel House Officials 3, Lavender House Wanderers 0. Their sense of the game unmatched. The cautious sweeper often seems to know what an opponent will do before they do. They use this knack to intercept a wanderer's pass. Looking to turn defence into attack, they ping a pass your way. Unfortunately, being one step ahead can sometimes be a curse. The pass goes a little too high for you to control. Luckily though, the opposing mascot is right behind you. The ball bounces off them, their cushioned suit robbing all of its momentum. They stumble around for a moment trying to figure out where the ball has dropped. With their view blocked by their costume, you have an opportunity to act. I can either kick the ball, take the opportunity to get the ball forward, or I can kick the opposing bee. Finally, a chance to cause some damage, I'm going to kick the bee. <laughs> you launch yourself into the opposing mascot, knocking them to the ground. They land heavily, unready for your tackle. They try to pull you down with them, but the ribbons they grasp onto pull free from your suit. Sensing the coming fray, the opposing team gathers. Before they can make their move, the enthusiastic defender appears to shield you. 
She even manages to get a couple of sneaky kicks in on the other mascot before the referee breaks things up. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes, let's uh, witness the enemy bees collapse. You've managed to outlast them. After a crunching tackle from the enthusiastic brawler, the opponent's mascot fails to rise up from the mud. The referee waits a moment, counting silently to themselves, or blowing the whistle. The game has ended, and you're still standing. The bonus goal goes to Chancel House officials, announces the referee. With the whistle blown, the game is over. The regulator rushes over as the final whistle blows. How are you feeling? I'm sorry for putting you through that. Who cares? The enthusiastic defender lifts you into the air with the help of the ancient striker. We won! A bloody nose and a few bruises is worth any victory. Your teammates carry you back towards the changing rooms, chanting your name. The ardent regulator slumps down onto one of the dressing shed benches beside you. Three games so close together, they say. They say. Absolutely exhausting, that. For a moment, they look weary. Then, in an instant, they shake it off. Barely a minute later, they've changed back into their bureaucrat suit, ready to stride back to Charnel House. The body may be tired, but the mind is awake. We've got the laws to consider, they say. Come and find me when you're ready. You accompany the regulator back to Chancel House. Tired from the games, both of you move a little slower than normal. The regulator's mind is clearly already back on the matter of their game's rules, unpicking elements of the match you just played. Wait, who's that? You follow the regulator's gaze, which is locked on a bulky figure, just exiting the regulator's office. For a moment, they stare at each other, and the figure turns and sprints away. The regulator takes off after them. You will your legs forward. One last sprint. But with that, I think I'm going to end this episode here. We shall chase after this mysterious stranger in the next episode. So thank you all so much for watching. Please like, subscribe, let me know what you think. Your comments are greatly appreciated and they all help the channel get attention and grow. And I do greatly appreciate it. Thank you again to the members and the coffee supporters. And as always... I'll see you next time.